let's uh, challenge here. So Prithvi, uh, let's play a strong player, 2000 plus. Uh, let's play the Karo Khan and see, see what happens there. So the Karo Khan is an opening where we just want to play d5 and we want to challenge for the center, but unlike in, let's say, the Scandinavian, where you play d5 immediately, the problem is there, after takes, you're kind of compelled to bring your queen out and then, you know, white can gain time on your queen. It's okay. Long story short is it's okay and it's a playable opening. But some players are a little bit more conservative, like me, and I prefer to play c6 here so that when I get d5, if he wants to take, I can recapture with a pawn and I get to have a pawn in the center. So I'm the kind of player, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the kind of player who generally doesn't like to give too much of the center, right? Even when I'm black, I like to fight for the center because it's so important, the center. Some players like to fianchetto, be more provocative, uh, things like the modern defense or even the hippopotamus defense. But for me, I like to play a little bit more classically. So here, uh, let's see, we can play in a variety of ways. Knight c6 is, is one of them, and white here can go knight to f3. Um, after which, the main line would continue with bishop g4. And what's interesting about this is, uh, these variations are theoretically, I think it, it goes towards a draw. So normally I wouldn't go bishop g4, because I would be worried that my opponent knows the theory, uh, and he certainly seems to, based on uh, the speed with which he's playing here. Uh, the correct thing is to capture this pawn. And the, the danger, of course, if you are black and you're playing a lower-rated opponent, you don't want to go into forcing, uh, forcing draws whenever possible if they know the theory. But, uh, well, maybe they'll surprise me and they won't. Looks like they're not surprising me. Yeah, so here this is all correct. He very much knows the theory. I cannot go queen d7 because they take, so I have to go king e7. And now there's even a, a really strange move, queen c5. It is playable, but it's it's not considered uh, not considered the best. So, so he goes queen takes b5. Uh, queen takes b5. And now should I play f6 first? Okay, let's go ahead and play f6. Wait, f6, queen check. I mean, I can I can also take and then play f6, but I'm a little bit worried. No, it's queen d7, I think is the theory, sorry. It's queen d7. For a second, I, this is actually a variation I don't play so much as black because of the fact that it's quite drawish. Uh, but I wanted to show you guys um, how the the influence of, uh, of theory at these higher levels. Um, and yeah, the, the basic point is that black, white can, yeah, white can capture. Now we can uh, capture back. And after takes the, the queen, we get this simplified uh, middle game where we've got five pawns each, and objectively speaking, it's equal. I know it, uh, I know it myself uh, from, from analysis. I actually did, a, uh, for, for, not for Chess Factor, but I did a, a, a course on, um, an openings course on the Karo Khan, where this line, I actually recommended it as a great way, as long as you don't mind a draw. Because it's, in theory, as, uh, when you're black, at the higher levels in chess, you the onus the onus of proof is on the burden of proof is on white. He's the one or she's the one that has to actually say, "I've got an advantage here." So an equal position like this, perfectly comfortable to play. Uh, so let's see what's what's going on in the chat. Sunny Shroom says, "What do you think of beginners playing lots of gambits? Is it good for improving tactics, or is it a crutch because you rely on opponents not knowing theory?" Um, I don't think that it's too relevant for improving tactics, if I'm honest. I think uh, tactics can be improved no matter what you play. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, what I think it's mostly good for is this the, this point that you make about that playing playing lots of gambits means that your opponents often will not know the theory. And I also think sometimes it can just be fun for people to, to play gambits. 
Um, personally, I'm a I'm an advocate of doing this. Play gambits when they're correct. So there are some gambits that are absolutely sound to play. Uh, and then just try and avoid playing like gambits that are wrong. Because I, I think it sucks when you try to catch out your opponent, but your opponent knows the trick, and then you're suddenly busted. Like the risk-reward ratio, it's not good, in my opinion. So I prefer to play gambits where even if your opponent knows, like then at least it's like equal. Equal, or maybe even being a tiny bit worse. That's okay, but don't play ones that are super dubious. Okay, so my opponent has castled here. And on the one hand, it looks as though my king is a little bit um, uh, out of shape here uh, to be exploited in the middle of the board. But on the other hand, the material is very reduced. So it, it shouldn't be a big deal. The question is, what's the best way to play? I know that sometimes in these variations, the king actually finds safety on f5. Uh, so let me see, king here, if rook e1, king f5, if rook d1, rook d8, that would be okay. Um, but you know what, I, I don't I don't love that. Let me start with rook d8, because I want to try and get my rook to d7. The reason I don't love king e6 is because maybe he goes something like um, bishop f4 here, and then if I go king f5, he puts his bishop on g3, and... Then I can try to develop my bishop, but suddenly he can put rooks on e1 and d1. It just felt slightly uncomfortable to me. Maybe it was the best move, but I prefer just rook d7, put the put the rook right here, uh, right on d8, protect the pawns. If bishop e3, maybe rook d7. And now that he's committed his rook to d1, now the idea of king e6 is suddenly a lot more attractive because there's less likelihood of rook e1 check, or at least that's going to be a bit of a waste of time for him. So let's go king e6, overprotecting the, the pawn. Somebody said, by the way, is lobbying says you are freezing. Is, is that correct? Is there some issue with the stream? Please let me know. So let me go rook d7 here. Hello, by the way, to everybody who uh, who just arrived. Hey, Chess Patzer, what's up? Uh, good to see you here. And uh, Gopo, <laughs> good to see you too. Um, hello to Broom and Dude Guy and to Ashen. So for those who might be new to the channel, what we're doing is just uh, this channel. It's a website as well. You guys can check it out, chessfactor.com. Uh, but it's all about trying to improve our chess. So it's got a bit of an educational uh, slant. So apologies for that. That's a terrible joke. I'll try to cut down on the amount of jokes for the remainder of the stream, but no promises. Now I'm just looking to develop. This is a position, by the way, which at the end of the day, it's not such a big deal to play because even if your opponent knows the theory, there's still lots of room for either player to go wrong. As we're seeing, we're seeing in this game, maybe I'm the one that's going a bit wrong here because I like how he's playing overall. Maybe I thought rook e1 might have been quite interesting here with the king uh, first, and then if king f5, only then rook d1. Might have maybe given me slight, slight problems, although I should have had rook d8 just supporting the pawn. Let's go bishop f6 here. I feel like I should put the bishop on this long diagonal. Uh, Aldous Chess says, it seems that you've memorized the movements that you have to do. Yeah, the, so the problem with this variation is I haven't reviewed it in quite a long time. So you start to forget things, at least if, if you're anything like me. But uh, in the past, this is a variation that I used to play over the board. And uh, so I studied it quite thoroughly. Um, simply, it's necessary to do this, especially at the higher levels in chess, you know, when you're facing regularly, you're facing not just IMs, which is uh, which would be my title, but also you're facing GMs. If you want to uh, score some kind of acceptable results from the black side, you better know your theory. From the white side, you can more or less uh, improvise, but from the black side, especially against 1e4, which is, as Fisher would say, best by test, super sharp, super active positions, you should know what you're doing. Let's go rook c8. 
I'm just taking open taking over this uh, open file, maybe some Rook C2 ideas. I'm quite liking my position. I do, at the end of the day, have the better structure than my opponent because of these pawns here. So I'm just about supporting my isolated pawn. And now my final piece is coming into play. My king is in the center. So although there's reduced material, I feel like I, I have chances here to maybe um, press for an advantage. <laughs> I like this. The guy says uh, he's bro man dude guy, not broom and dude. <laughs> not broom and dude guy. Sorry about that. Um, people saying the stream is fine, so that's good. Uh, sorry, by the way, let me just go up to make sure that there were no comments I missed. Echo Sand, yay, Caro just started to work on that. Glad to hear it. I think the Caro is a great opening uh, for most people. I think maybe at the Grandmaster level, I feel e4, e5 or e4, c5 might be a little more reliable for my for my tastes. But uh, at the club level, I think e4, c6 is great because at the club level, so many people, they don't know how to play. Um, they just don't know how to play against uh, the Caro Can because you get all sorts of pawn structures. You don't have any, let's say, cookie cutter plans. It's not so easy to play your typical scheme, whereas against the Sicilian, very often people will play, you know, let's say the close Sicilian, and they put the knight on c3, they fianchetto their bishop, maybe they play f4, and it's like the first 10, 12 moves, they're able to play them without thinking. In the Karo Khan, that's harder to do if you're white, so it's a nice way to take advantage of your opponents. Uh, so Broman Dude asked, what do I think about the Yusupov book series? Uh, I think it's great, and I recommend it to a lot of my students. Definitely, if you're thinking about getting it, I think it's great. I don't think, you know, it's not the solution to all life's problems, but uh, it gives you a lot of well-selected exercises. I think there are some things that if I were to, you know, have created the series, I might have done slightly differently. Uh, maybe I would have written a little bit more uh, text and um, things like that. But overall, I think it's one of the best resources out there at the moment. So I'm debating whether I should go rook c3, maybe get a pair of rooks off the board to ease the pressure here against d5, or to go rook c2 and just infiltrate with the rook. The only problem with rook c2 is what's my follow-up? I mean, I don't actually have any targets, and he's defending here uh, with the rook. So the rook on c2, it kind of looks pretty, but it's not doing so much. So I'm going to go rook c3 after all. I feel that if I can get one pair of rooks off the board, then I have more chances, for example, to press d4. So for example, rook takes, bishop takes. Already, I have the possibility of playing d4 on the next move. And, uh, and then once I play d4, I can start to invade with the king, and I can try and uh, put pressure against this queen side here. But uh, with rook c2, I, I didn't see a way to do that because the only way I would see after rook c2 is to try and bring my other rook into play. But as I say, I was tied down to the defense at this point. So he goes king g2. I feel I'm going to go ahead and take, although I could go d4 immediately. Maybe that's a little bit better. If d4, bishop takes, rook takes. And the point is, after rook takes, I can take here on d4. So after d4, what can he do? He can take here, but then I take on c3. He can go rook takes, king takes. He could even grab this pawn, but then I would go c2, and when he goes back, I would go bishop b2, and I would win the, the bishop for, for my pawn. So after d4, he doesn't have bishop d2, because I can take here. I just don't see any drawbacks. Although... Hmm... One advantage of playing rook takes d3, rook takes d3, d4, is that then, say he moves his bishop, then when I play king d5, on the next move I'll play king c4, and because his rook is on d3, I'll actually gain time against that rook. So now I have to decide between one thing or another. Um, also, d4, rook takes, takes, rook takes, king takes, if he simply doesn't take on a7, but plays a move like king here. 
Then I can go c2, but he's actually in time. He'll go bishop c1. And my king will be sort of ugly here on d7. Uh, and my pawn on c3 might even be vulnerable. So I don't like those things. I'm going to therefore take here and first play d4. That way I make sure I don't have a pawn on c3 that might actually get, um, get hounded and get sort of corralled up fast. And I make sure I don't have my king on d7. Um, so one uh, very, very useful exercise uh, tactic, by the way, let's say that you play a game like this and people talk about, you know, this also feeds into this question about which game uh, or whether blitz games or faster time control games can still help you to learn. And I said, if you analyze them, they can help you. So here's an example. Imagine that I put this game through the computer afterwards and the computer says, I clearly I had two ideas in my mind, d4 or rook takes. If the computer tells me, that my choice of uh, rook takes first is best, then good. But if it tells me actually d4 was best, one exercise I sometimes like to do is I like to say to myself, okay, computer has told me that d4 is best. Now let me try and think, why is d4 best? Can I figure it out? I no longer have the pressure of the clock or anything like that. So I can take 10 minutes to figure it out if I need. But that will help me to calculate, to visualize, and importantly, I think it's a really good exercise because this is a moment in the game, a type of mistake that I made, me. It's not just a book full of tactics. This was my own mistake. So maybe there is a blind spot there. And I, this, this way of working, I find, helps you to uh, improve upon your blind spots. So you're king d5. Ashen asks, what do you think about the two knights attack against uh, Karokan? Yeah, one of the most, uh, let's say, the Karokan is one of those openings that is fundamentally correct. If you ask me, gun to my head, and I mean, preferably you doesn't need to get to such an extreme situation, but, but if someone, some serious chess devotee were to point a gun to my head and ask me what's the best uh, option objectively against the Karokan, I would say the advanced variation. So e4, c6, d4, e5. Uh, but the two knights is, is right up there, and I've actually played it as white myself. It's a very good system. Here, white wants to put his king on e2 and king d2, and that's going to be helpful for him to a stop my d4 pawn and b uh, hold his queen side together against potential advances. Also, if king c4, then king e2 supports the rook. If I give a check, then king d2. And it seems to me like uh, he's just about hanging on. So I want to prevent those plans. So I'll go rook e7. And now with his king uh, stuck on the king side, it's going to be very, very difficult for him to play because he can try to fight and bring his king over. Let's say rook d1, king c4. This move a4, it's generally a bad idea to play aggressively. It's almost like he's saying, let me try and use this two pawns against one to try and put pressure against you. But he cannot do this when my pieces are so much better coordinated than his. So this helps helps uh, white, uh, helps black and his plans. Now, be very, very tactically alert because if he moves the rook, taking this pawn would actually give me a losing position. Can anybody in the chat maybe find out what's the problem with capturing that pawn? I need an answer quickly though, because I think actually this has a stream delay. <laughs> so I really need an answer quickly, but I'll give it like uh, maybe another 15, 20 seconds. So anybody who's watching this video, maybe on YouTube or something like that, you guys can also test yourselves. What is the problem with the capture? Bishop d6, go Paul. Fourth town, Chess Patser UK, both of you guys are absolutely alert to this bishop d6 broman dude guy also picking up on this tactic okay so can i go d3 i feel like i can let's let's go ahead and do that yeah he so he was ready he was ready for me had i uh, slipped up i'm gonna go rookie two just to make sure his king is is stuck and i'm gonna use maybe this tactical opportunity here a5 he cannot take because king takes bishop and now maybe he's going to take this pawn. Let me go rook e7 just to make sure no rook d7 stuff. And now I'll go rook here. He can push, but I'll just go rook here. He can maybe go rook b5 check and pick up pick up this pawn. 
But at this point, the clock situation was too much. So we do convert. Let's actually put that, uh, put, put our theories to the test here. Uh, did we make the right decision at uh, this decision point here when we were considering between d4 and root takes d3? So we fire on the engine and we can see rook takes d3 is actually uh, the best move in the position with the follow-up uh, of d4 and king d5. And so in this case, uh, we get it correct so we can move on. Or if you want, you can confirm that your other variation, uh, the reasons why you felt your other variation of d4 were not so good was because of rook takes d3. So you can confirm if this variation was actually the problem. King takes, and now I had said king f1. So exactly, king f1, everything else, black is pushing this pawn, but after king f1, c2, and bishop c1, everything else wins because black has this bishop b2 idea. But after bishop c1, you kill off that possibility. And then I had said my king on d7 would be bad and the pawn on c2. So this isn't, um, this isn't uh, tooting my own horn, uh, patting myself on the back uh, session, although Nevertheless, I'll take it, <laughs> but the, 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 the point isn't that, but it's just to, uh, it's just to, to make sure, like whenever, whenever you have an important decision point, check, did you make the right decision? And if not, and, and try and understand the reason why you made either the right or the wrong decision. Okay. So let's go back. 